friends, as the name of this institution is Vedanta Society, so you may be already familiar with the word Vedanta, must have been hearing about this talks by many visitors here, including your Swami who gives regular lectures. So I don't know what I am to add to the things that you have already heard. I do not know what lectures contained before. But anyway, the subject is such as needs to be frequently thought about. And when I am giving you my talk, it is in the way of my thinking on the subject the authority of which is considered to be the Vedas, which in the East is known as the eternal source of knowledge. And Vedanta means the end or deepest mystery of the Vedas. Vedanta is not any sectarian scripture. You do not find any mention of any sect in the whole of the literature. The word Vedanta means absolutely free from all denominational religions. It is a way of life and it is a dissertation on the ultimate truth which can be attained with prolonged practice and does not require any belief in any dogma or any special ritual. Usually by Vedanta means a rational understanding of the mysteries of the Vedas. Now this rational understanding is such that any man just with the common understanding can understand every bit of it, does not require any, does not demand any faith in any particular religion, or philosophy. Just a rational understanding of it can be had with one's common sense. That is one thing. And another thing it means not only an intellectual understanding of it, but also a way of life. Direct realization of the ultimate truth. That is the aim of Vedanta. Firstly, you should remember that the Veda have stated categorically that the truth cannot be attained by the exercise of your intellect alone. That is not enough. There is one passage 
which I like to tell you as a preliminary requirement of the understanding of the Vedas. It is stated there. In Sanskrit I mention and then I shall give you the translation. Navirato Dusharita Nashanto Nashamahita Nashanto Manaso Vapi Pragnane Nainamapnuyat. This truth cannot be attained by mere exercise of intellect unless one has refrain from bad conduct, wrong conduct, unless he has calmed down his mental states, process of thinking, ideations, unless one has withdrawn his senses from sense objects which constantly make the thinkers go astray. Unless one has concentrated his mind on the truth, fundamental truth, unless he has remained constantly engaged in that pursuit of truth. The truth cannot be attained by mere exercise of intellect. Though I tell you it is to be understood by the mind, because mind alone is capable of thinking, but mere mind is not enough. The mind has to be freed from all preconceptions, all desires, all our likes and dislikes. Unless we have freed ourselves from any bias that we may have, the truth cannot be attained by mere intellect, because intellect will be always vitiated by these tendencies that we have acquired through perhaps generations, series of births and deaths, as we believe in rebirth. Now, therefore, the study has to be done very carefully so that our individuality, our biased mind does not superimpose something in the truth and make it distorted, just like a prism distorts, a, a bad glass distorts the vision. So our mind also has to be carefully prepared for the study of the Vedanta. I mentioned this as precondition, without which we shall not be capable of understanding the truth. Now the process is very simple. The process of thinking of the Vedanta is very simple. As I told you, our mind is the instrument by means of which we can consider the truth, and that mind has to be freed from all biases, all preconceived notions. And the sages who have propounded this truth, they have simply instructed us to understand our experiences, the sum total of our experiences. It's a comprehensive study. Our whole human experience 
should we 